Hello everybody and welcome back to Tans Has Talk, the world's only English language program focusing primarily on Hungarian folk music. My name is Kalman Magyar Uchi, speaking to you again from Toronto, Canada, home of the eternal lockdown. Episodes of Tansa's Talk, which combine a mix of music and stories delivered by me, are available as always on tanshaz.com, that's T-A-N-C-H-A-Z.com, or on YouTube. Just search Tansa's Talk and subscribe so you don't miss anything. Today, we have an episode of Tansa's Talk Interviews. This is where I delve into long-form interviews with a wide array of guests. Episodes of Tansa's Talk Interviews are available on all popular podcast platforms, including Apple, Google, Spotify, podcast stores, and all the other ones. Make sure you subscribe and leave a nice review if you like what you hear, and hopefully you do and you will. Today, I'm excited to have on the program Zina Bozai, joining us from Budapest. She's got a really remarkable background. If you haven't heard of her yet, you certainly will in the years to come, as she's really on the forefront of Hungarian folk singing, uh, folk music education all around the world. Um, Zina was born in 1982 in San Francisco. Hey, I remember that year. She's a bit younger than me. Uh, Her father is a Hungarian immigrant to the U.S. and her mother is a native San Franciscan with Native American Alsatian and other European ancestry. Zina grew up in San Francisco, immersed in classical music primarily as a pianist a horn player and a composer, and she also sang in choruses. While Zina certainly heard traditional music from around the world growing up, she was not a part of the local Bay Area Hungarian community. In fact, she didn't even know it existed, and we'll talk about that during the interview. Most of Zina's exposure to Hungarian culture was primarily through her grandmother, who grew up in Hungary and had immigrated to the U.S. as an adult. Zina had done some traveling back and forth to Hungary with her family growing up and, and heard the, you know, the typical coffee house, uh, you know, cigan music, uh, Roma music and operetta type of stuff. But like with many people, the traditional village music or Tansa's music, unfortunately, had eluded her. Uh, Zina attended the extraordinary Oberlin Conservatory of Music. That's Oberlin outside of Cleveland, Ohio from where she graduated with a Bachelor's of Music with honors in 2004. When she was at Oberlin, she first started learning about Bartók and Kodai, but her professors didn't present the original field recording sources, only the compositions that were inspired by those collections. And Zina said, wait a second, I'm curious, I want to hear the sources too. So she started a search for the original field recordings of Bartók and Kodai. And she was quickly smitten, of course, and found a real passion in this village music. And she decided the best way to delve into this and to Hungarian folk singing was to move to Budapest. She made her first move to Budapest in 2006. In the ensuing years, she lived back and forth between Budapest and California. Uh, In the meantime, she attended Mills College in the San Francisco area from where she received her master's degree in music composition in 2009. Unsurprisingly, Her master's thesis was in Hungarian folk music. In the meantime, she studied Hungarian folk singing with some of the Tansas movement's real luminaries, Fabian Eva, Ogoc Gergely, and Andrea Novratil, and many others. And Zina has been permanently living in Budapest since 2017. She has performed all over the place, Tansas Talakozo at the Hagyományok Háza, which is the Hungarian Heritage House, the National Theater, the Hungarian Parliament, and back closer to home here in the U.S., she's performed at the San Francisco Ethnic Dance Festival and everybody's favorite, the Golden Festival in New York. She regularly visits the last living village singers in various parts of the Carpathian Basins to learn about their lives and their songs, and we will talk about that for sure in the interview. She is the spearhead of two very interesting musical and singing projects. The first project is Vadalma, which is a kind of a fusion band which arranges folk songs in an innovative way. Uh, Vadalma has performed in venues throughout the U.S. and Europe. Well, the other project is the very well-known Hungarian Folk Singing Circle, or the Népdal Kör, 
which Zena founded in 2010 in San Francisco, which has now migrated with her over to Budapest through the folk singing circle. Zena works for magic, teaching uh, uh, singing to folks around the world. In fact, Zena is quite the prolific teacher. She's taught across the U.S. and Hungary, including at the Obuda Folk Music School, the Rakoci Sövetsé camps, uh, Frightened Salvage and Ashkenaz uh, uh, clubs in Berkeley, uh, Moktar Hungarian Cultural Alliance in Los Angeles, and of course at the Hungarian Heritage House, the Honyobanyo Casa in Budapest. Even before the pandemic, uh, she had started to teach somewhat online, but now obviously she's doubled down on the online teaching, and she has a very exciting uh, series of courses coming up she'll tell you about, and I hope you might be able to attend to learn from her directly. Zina is a single mom of two beautiful daughters, Bea, I love that name, that's my wife's name, who is nine, and Evla, who is turning six. She also finds time to work on projects as a consultant, a mentor, translator, and proofreader with her, when the, her expertise is needed, including projects involving the Hungarian Heritage House and nominations related to Hungary with respect to uh, United Nations Education, Scientific, and Cultural Organization uh, awards and grants and the like. Zina also works with some of uh, Hungary's top singers and groups uh, on their English language materials. This is very important. And uh, she helps develop programming that's oriented toward non-Hungarian speaking audiences and the international stage. Um, there's a very good de and detailed website for her. That's zinabozzai.com. That's her name, dot com. Uh, for a lot more info about her. Uh, though we've never met personally, uh, I'm very happy to have her on the program. I love meeting people through this venue here, through this, uh, uh, through this medium of Tansas Talk interviews, and I'm very happy to have Zina Bozoi from Budapest on Tansas Talk. Hello, Zina. Hello, Colin, and thank you so much for the wonderful introduction, and thank you for having me. Oh, it's my, my, really my pleasure, Zina. I've seen you, I've seen interviews, I've heard about you, uh, I've been tracking your, uh, your your career in the last few years and all the wonderful things you're doing for our, the Tansas movement and, and Hungarian folklore in general. So it's a real honor and privilege and pleasure to have you here today. Um, you know, uh, I've heard you speak Hungarian on these interviews, and I know you learned Hungarian later in life, um, mm -hmm. yet your father is Hungarian. So if you can uh, t t talk about a bit about that and and how come you didn't learn Hungarian as a child? And when did you eventually start to learn it? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, my dad was born here in Hungary in Győr in 1942, so at the time of World War II, and and left with his parents, which is to say that his, his parents left with him as a small child and fled to Austria, and then eventually he and his mother made their way to the United States. And because he started school in the United States in the 1950s, when, of course, there was the cultural pressure to assimilate and he was badly you know teased by all of his peers he uh, did lose the language um, he also was not within a hungarian community in the united states but was then growing up on various military bases because his mother my grandmother had remarried an american pilot so he was in a very different situation than some of the other families who immigrated especially those who came later after the 1956 revolution here in Hungary. And so because he was in that in that context, both socially at school and in his family, um, he, he lost his own native tongue, which meant that I grew up without it spoken in my household and my immediate family, even though there were kind of bits of it here and there. And I heard my grandmother speak it. And we came back to Hungary in the summers when I was a young child. And of course, I heard it spoken. So I had some exposure, but um, only once I finished conservatory was I able to move back to Hungary, as you talked about, to be able to learn the language. Huh. So, so there was a discernible kind of um, uh, bullying or some kind of teasing that the you know the World War II wave of immigrants uh, experienced uh, versus like the 1956 clan that was a little different. Mm -hmm. Like, have you looked into that? That's very interesting to hear. My my understanding is that it was very different, especially because young children were talking first graders, you know, six and seven year olds didn't know the difference between, you know, a German kid or a Hungarian kid or something. And, and my understanding from hearing the family stories is that they just sort of saw them as other and saw them as barbarian. They even called them sauerkraut, or, you know, just various names that kids do. And that's very different than, you know, after 1956, when I think there, at least 
for, for some groups of people, depending on what kind of news they were reading or such, they might have seen the Hungarians as heroes. So I know everyone's story is very different. It's hard to make big generalizations like that. Mm-hmm. At least that was my dad's experience. And he wasn't in a community of Hungarian speakers here, or, or there rather, in the diaspora. Right. So they are in the San Francisco, yeah. You meant, or well, all he, over, where, where yeah, he I moved mean, all over. I, he, even, he eventually settled in San Francisco, which is where I was born, but he was growing up all over the place at various military bases, so not within one of the many Hungarian-American communities. Right, and and then, and your mom, um, mm-hmm. I mentioned it was Alsatian, so that's, that's like mm-hmm. a French-German mix kind of thing? Right, her dad's family is from Alsace-Lorraine, Right, exactly at the border of France and Germany, and her mother is Native American, Blackfoot, and Lenin Lenape, and also uh, with often say European mutt, English, Irish, Pennsylvania, and Dutch, and that sort of thing. So um, they had been in San Francisco on one side for a few generations, and also had that um, European um, immigrant side to the family. And and then my grandmother herself grew up on a small farm in Ohio. So. It's a it's a it's a diverse family background. I yeah, I'll say. say. Is is your father <laughs> is your father still with us? Yes, my parents are both still living, and in fact, both of my grandmothers are still living, which is really a, a special thing. They're both in their late nineties now, and I I just really treasure that they're still living because I learned so much from both of them actually related to this work, even though it would seem you know, only one of them is Hungarian, and of course, her love for her homeland and her stories and her nostalgia and the trauma she experienced in that immigration we were talking about, of course, made a big impression on me, but also the American one who I just mentioned grew up on a farm, you know, without running water or electricity and having lots of animals and vegetables and, and all of that. The kinds of values that she taught me actually are quite similar to what I then found in my song collecting work in Transylvania. So yeah. even though I could no longer see that in Ohio, you know, it's now a parking lot where that farm was, I could still see it in Transylvania and the commonalities there. So I really value what I got from both of them. That's so cool. So uh, your your grandma, the Hungarian one, I presume mm-hmm. uh, did not forget Hungarian, right? No, of course not, no. Okay, so now do you speak with her in Hungarian? You know, we actually do go back and forth. We, cool. you know, my whole childhood, we spoke with each other in English. So it's taken some time for her to get used to speaking with me in Hungarian. But in our conversations in recent years, it's a real mix, and that's a real joy for me and for her. So you're kind of reintroducing your family and your dad as well to his own culture through through your work, huh? Um, in a way, yes. <laughs> you know, in a way, um, we have such different experiences with the culture, too. You know, my grandmother was living here in, in Hungary in the 20s and 30s and early 40s, which was, of course, a very different time than it is now. And my dad also has his own relationship with Hungarian culture. So, yeah. you know, um, my experience with sort of the village music, I think there there is a part where it's like, why are you listening to those old toothless grannies? So yeah, I think <laughs> yes, there's, a, yes. um, yeah. there, there's a real difference there in, in what our experiences are with the culture, because, of course, like every culture, it's multifaceted and there's, you know, generational differences and, and, and differences between all these urban and rural layers of society. So, Well, you attended Oberlin, which, uh, you know, for those mm-hmm. that don't know, is a, a wildly competitive uh, conservatory to get into. It's, you know, it's up there with the Juilliards and, uh, and, 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 and Eastman School, whatever, you know, I mm-hmm. mean, it's a very serious school. So, so you, I mean, you must have been practicing like mad as a, as a as a, a teenager, uh, a, a <laughs> piano and horn. Talk talk a bit more about that and what kind of stuff you were you mm-hmm. were doing and uh, you know uh, uh, musically because uh, this leads into your work at Oberlin through and, mm-hmm. and where you accidentally reconnected with your Hungarian side. So what's you know to talk a bit about your your upbringing musically. Mm-hmm. So I, I grew up in classical music. I, I wanted to play piano right from very, very young age. So I, I begged for lessons when I was really, really little and, and started um, when I was five or six. And I thought that all musicians write their own music. I didn't realize as a five-year-old that that, that um, composing music and performing music were, were two different tasks. I thought everybody was coming up with the music that they were playing. And so I was going to my piano lessons every week, bringing in my new songs. And I was very fortunate to have a piano teacher who didn't tell me otherwise. Um, so for me, composing and playing piano kind of went hand in hand um, from a young age. And then I, when I was in middle school, you had to pick a band instrument. So I ended up playing horn, which is sort of a, a, an accidental instrument that I ended up playing. But through that, I then went to School of the Arts High School, which was really 
Hmm. fortunate. I already knew that I wanted to be a musician, so that was clear to me um, by the time I was entering high school, and that was also a competitive audition school, even more so at that time than it is now because it was much smaller at that time. Mm -hmm. And um, so I got to major in instrumental music in high school, and it was right on the campus of a college as well, so I got to take various college music classes and be part of chamber groups and, and all sorts of things like that through high school. And I went to the Tanglewood Institute in composition. Wow. So there were, there were various programs, even through the American Composers Forum as well, to have professionals performing the pieces that I was writing. And that's how I was able to build up a body of work to submit to Oberlin. So I was admitted to Oberlin as a, in the composition program. Okay, so it wasn't like you were practicing four hours piano a day in order to crack through at Oberlin. You, you, you applied as uh, on the composition side. That's right. And in fact, that was a, a big change in my life because um, actually... There were some composer performers, but for the most part, you were encouraged to really focus your energy just on composing if you were there as a composer. So mm -hmm. it was a real change for me from being an active performer because through those teenage years in high school, I was playing six, seven hours a day, six or seven days a week in various different orchestras and chamber groups. And um, so it was a really big change to not be an active performer anymore. Although I did join an early music choir there that had a very big impact on me. I really loved um, early music. So in addition to the various um, other kind of traditional musics that I had played um, back in California, I, I did get to keep expanding what I was exposed to at Oberlin as a performer too. I don't know if you, I think this was a Victor Borg joke. They said, you know, he specializes in early music. They say, how early? He says, like, around 6.30 a.m., he says. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. In this case, I mean more like what a lot of people might think it was Gregorian chant. Or right. Or Renaissance choral music. Yeah. Right. So uh, by the way, when you say horn, you mean French horn, right? Right. Yeah, that's a tough instrument. Oh boy, that's <laughs> the that's the violin of the of the uh, of the brass section, you know. Um, <laughs> I so. so, what was what did your stuff sound like? Uh, like, what kind of music were you composing? Was it very mm -hmm. ephemeral, contemporary, or or was it rooted in something that maybe was in the background of your psyche for of your Hungarianness? Actually, you're right on the track with that with that question because um, I was really interested in writing vocal music even before I was at Oberlin, and I was always asking the singers to um, to sing with sort of a less classical. You know, I wasn't very into the the aesthetic sound of the you know kind of opera type singing voice or classical singing voice, and I kept asking them to sing non vibrato or sort of a more natural speaking tone. I didn't really have the vocabulary at the time to mm. say head voice or chest voice or or um, you know, to use sort of more like folk music terminology for it, but I was asking for a more natural sound, and sometimes I was singing the pieces too, just because I couldn't find classically trained singers who could give the kind of vocal quality that I was looking for. And um, so I was also writing chamber music for for instruments, but I was very interested in voice, and that's one of the threads that eventually led me to Hungarian folk singing, because you know, obviously we had the family background that we talked about, and then. Um, you know, kind of interest in traditional musics generally and wanting to kind of go beyond the major and minor scales and the things that I was seeing in the avant-garde, you know, classical contemporary world, but to hear more of the different kinds of, um, you know, scales, intonations, rhythms, instruments, timbres that are, that are from other styles of music. And then, as you mentioned in the intro about being exposed to Bartók and Kodai, who I had been exposed to early in my childhood as well, but in the music history classes, of course, there's such major figures that we learned about them. And, and as you said, I really was interested in hearing the recordings that we heard about that they had done. So that's mm -hmm. really what led me on to on to a big search as soon as right. I finished Oberlin. Uh, Oberlin's what is like an hour from Cleveland or something or even mm -hmm. less? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what, what was it? I mean, you were, you were there for four years, correct? Or three, yeah, three yeah. and a half, actually, because I, I took off a semester and went to Argentina to study Argentinian folk music just on my own, just <laughs> took, oh. a, took a semester and, and traveled in Argentina, but I was still able to graduate uh, within the, you know, with uh, one semester less because I had done so much of college when I was still in high school. So, right, right. <laughs> yeah. So, so what was it like living in Oberlin? I'm, uh, you know, after it's a far cry mm -hmm. from San Francisco, I think. Yeah, it was a big change. Um, I, I actually really enjoyed being in a small town. You know, it, it's very much 
a college town, just a few thousand people. And, um, you know, to have the four seasons, which of course we don't have in San Francisco and, and just to really be focused on the studies. I didn't have a car at that time. So you were asking about the distance to Cleveland. I actually only went to Cleveland a couple of times, mostly just to get to the airport, <laughs> um, you know, between semesters, I really was able to just focus on the conservatory. And I, I appreciate that when I see, you know, other friends or, you know, friends of mine who are in college now and they're in an urban environment where there's so much else going on around them and in their lives, I think about what a radically different experience that would be because I really was just in the Oberlin bubble and completely immersed in my studies. Yeah, well, you, you graduated with honors, so you did pretty well. You paid attention. Thank you. <laughs> and, and now um, this class, this magical moment, though, let's call it, um, where you start learning more about Bartok and Kodai, who, of course, you've probably heard of growing up, but, but you know, you're, you're in some class and the professors are talking um, can you take me back there uh, in mm-hmm. the early 2000s when you when you kind of mm-hmm. heard about this? And, and I'm just curious what they teach mm-hmm. at Oberlin about Bartok and Kodai to begin with. Well, let's also mention that this is coming up on 20 years ago at this point. But but <laughs> so it could have changed since then in yeah. the sense that, uh, you know, I don't want to give anybody a, a, a good or bad name in the sense of the curriculum very well might have changed um, since 2002, 2003. But um that's exactly 20 years ago. Yeah. Isn't it? So, hey, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, basically, we were learning about the um, advent of recording technology and about music history, the, the history of music history and of musicology and ethnomusicology, and and um, and learned about their collecting work and um, going to villages and and how the the factors coincided of the creation of the you know, actual technology to record and the, the interest that they had in in that peasant music, as they uh, might have called it, mm-hmm. um, which we don't usually say it that way nowadays. But like you mentioned, you know, our professors were, were playing, for example, their compositions, which were titled things like Hungarian folk dance or, or what have you. And, and of course, I was asking the question, well, but where are the field recordings? And, you know, at that time, I wasn't aware of the Institute for Musicology, the um, part of the Academy of Sciences here in, in Hungary, having these massive archives. You know, we were learning about it from afar, and this is right at the time when Google was starting to exist, so it didn't really seem like the kind of thing you could type into Google like you could now. Right, right. And, um, you know, you were mentioning a magic moment, and I know people are, are kind of always wanting to, there to be that, and I, I guess I would say that that magic moment came later what was happening at that time for me was that I just really wanted to find it. It really, the spark for me was the curiosity. I had the threads that we've talked about in terms of my own identity as a Hungarian American and, and of being interested in vocal music and having been exposed to other types of folk singing. I, you know, had awareness of Bulgarian folk singing and, and other Eastern European styles. And I really just wanted to know what Hungarian folk singing sounded like. I had some vague memories, like you said, of, you know, coffee house music, but I didn't really know what connection there was or wasn't with the village music that we were learning about in the classes. So it really was just, there were all these threads sort of around it, but I felt a real strong desire to hear what these village songs actually sounded like before their sort of classical interpretations or, or European or um, American, you know, choral in- interpretations. Um, so I would say the magic moment really more so happened a couple of years later when I had saved up and then moved to Hungary and then got to the Obuda Folk Music School and sat down with Fabian and Eva mm-hmm. and started learning the songs. And then it was, ah, this is the songs, right? So it actually right. took me oh. moving to Hungary to, I, I actually made the move and sat down the singing classes and then fell in love with the music once I was already here. Right. So so nowadays you can go uh, onto the onto the website of the Zenel Academia or, or, or whatever it is, and they, they will have, you know, the, and yeah, not the Zen Academia, but the Zen Tudomani Tezat, which is the Institute for Musicology at right. the Hungarian right. Academy of Sciences. So all right. of the archives, which are absolutely massive, have been, well, okay, let's not say all, but a, a huge quantity of the material has been um, digitized and put online. The archives are freely available to anyone. You don't need a secret password or anything like that, and you don't have to pay for it. It's all um, uploaded and very logically organized and labeled in terms of, you know, what village it's from, song types and, that, and who sang it and all that sort of thing. And you can search through those archives and there are newer and newer um, archives being created by various institutions. There's one at the Hungarian Heritage House. There's uh, a new one 
that just was created that has an even more kind of user friendly uh, interface. Um, so right. it there there continue to be developments in it, but even as it is now, you can search for really a, a many many thousands of recordings. Not not to get too deep, but what is the one you mentioned that has a very help a very helpful interface? Yeah, so Hungaritsana or Hungarikana, um, it's H U N G A R I C A N A. Okay. So it kind of spelled like Hungarikana. Yeah. Um, and um, and that's through the Institute for Musicology that I was just talking about. Gotcha. Okay. So, <clears throat> and of course, to have someone like Fabian Eva bring that to life and explain the context of it is important as well because we can Google all we want and listen to stuff, but you know putting it to the right context, understanding where it comes from, who's singing, etc. Um, right. Th- 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 that's key as well. Um, uh, Zina, and, the method, yeah, and the method that she taught the songs was playing the, the exact village recordings that I was just talking about, those collections that Bartok and Kodai and then later scholars also made. And, and she would play the recording and just play two seconds of it, and we'd sing it back and play two more seconds, and we'd sing it back. So it was just... Great. Absolutely, directly from the source. I, Go I, ahead. Sorry. I, I, no, it's, I would not expect anything less from Obuda. Uh, I know my nephews uh, go there still. Uh, to, to to learn um, and it's a wonderful music school. Um, one of mm-hmm. the one of the origin one of the OGs uh, in in, right. in Budapest. Um, but have you considered what happens if you don't you don't hear that ethnomusicology lecture in that class? You know, and you don't delve into the into Hungarian music. You don't end up moving over to Budapest. What is Zina mm-hmm. Bozai doing today? Like, are you a composer <laughs> or what? French horn player? What, what's going on? What do you think? Oh, you know, I actually think that all paths would have led me to Rome, so to speak, in the sense that mm. I, I think it was an inevitable path for me, one way or another. The the curiosity was inside of me, and it was such an organic uh, sequence of events to me that that I ended up here. Of all the different types of music for me to follow. It was natural for me to follow the thread of my own family's history. And I I, I really didn't fit in that contemporary classical world. I, I think no matter what, I would have ended up in, in something related to ethnomusicology. But, um, but yeah, I, I ended up here in Hungary. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's well, an interesting question. Because, well, yeah. when you enter, enter conservatory, you know, your colleagues are chatting, oh, I'm going to play in the New York Phil, and I'm going to, you know, compose ballets right. or whatever it is. And then, and then, you know, you're saying something too uh, as a first, second year, you know, what, mm-hmm. that, and certainly maybe you don't have a concrete plan, but did you have one at that time? Um, I really wanted to be writing music that was not in the style of my peers and professors, which is part of why it was saying sort of not not fitting in, you know, there was a real aesthetic feeling of it has to, I remember there was one particular class that I, that I took where it was, you know, you're not allowed to have melody, you're not allowed to have repetition, you're not allowed to have a stable rhythm, it sort of all needed to be pointillistic and all, always unexpected, always unpredictable. And, and for me, I, I was already bored by that. I had already been hearing all the avant-garde stuff from the previous decades growing up in, you know, very yeah. open-minded and liberal and diverse San Francisco. And I I didn't feel that that was new and exciting anymore. And I actually was wanting to write things that, like I said, left major and minor by going to different modes rather than being so, um, you know, contemporary classical sounding, but by using, you know, asymmetric rhythms and by using different vocal timbres and mm. ultimately exactly the things as you can hear and I'm describing that I ended up finding in the folk songs. So in a way, the, the things that I was wanting to write were that, you know, had the kind of ingredients that I was looking for musically and that eventually I found in the folk singing. When you did your master's uh, the course, uh, the courses or your master's degree, I know you had your thesis in Hungarian folk music, but it's usually a little more specific. What was the exact topic that you looked at? Mm. Yeah, I was looking at contemporary Hungarian folk singing in Budapest. In other words, some of the institutions that we've already mentioned um, and some of the singers that are active, I interviewed um, singers like, in, including uh, Fabian Eva, who we've talked about, and Nitrai Marian, as well as um, Paya Bea, for example, and Saloki Agi, to ask about their relationships with um, folk singing and, and how they viewed authenticity, um, but also going through these kinds of, um, like I said, the, the institutions and organizations, how, how the style was manifesting in Budapest at that time. Is that the thesis? I know it's not like a PhD, but is that thesis uh, available anywhere to look at? 
Uh, that's a good question. I actually don't know. I mean, it's probably in the Mills Library. Ah. Um, but I certainly give a much more updated version of it in the lectures that I give nowadays. So, you know, it's still right. kind of at the beginning of my path, but that that interest in creating sort of a, in a way, a resource guide, you know, led right into the work that I've then continued to do to kind of build up, you know, lectures and talks and presentations to show people, okay, here's here's all the places that you can find this music today. You mentioned some of these people, uh, you know, Saloki, Nitroi, etc. Um, who, uh, mentors in this, in this industry, or industry, in this field, <laughs> industry, <laughs> how dare I? <laughs> So uh, in this in this uh, in this field here, mentors are, is, is key. So you know, mm -hmm. um, finding mentors and it's harder and harder now as the as the, as the villagers, so to speak, are dying out. Unfortunately, or getting sick or too old to play, whatever. But but um, who do you consider your real mentors? And 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 I, I we can start with Fabian Eva, who's very special mm -hmm. and has touched many many hearts over the years and brought a lot of people yes. into the singing world. But uh, you know, take me back to, I guess this is now 15, 16 years ago, you're first mm -hmm. coming to Budapest and, and who are some of your mentors and uh, in the in the city, we'll talk about the villages a little later, but you know, mm -hmm. more urban, uh, the, you know, the Tansas, Tansas uh, generation mentors. Yeah, well, she, she really was my first and most primary mentor um, over those first few years. I was, um, as you mentioned, a little bit back and forth because I came to Hungary, and then I got into the master's program, so I went back to the United States, but I came back in the middle to do that research for the thesis we just talked about, and when I finished the master's, I came back again, and, you know, so, but in that, in that whole time period of those first few years that I was immersing myself in the style, she really was my main mentor, and I also got to know, as I mentioned, uh, Marianne, I guess I should say in English name order, so Marianne Nitrai, mm -hmm. um, and uh, Gergely Ogoc, but it's so funny to say it in English name order, isn't it? And yeah. Andrea Navratil. It's Gregory, and, and, Gregory Agox, yes. Yeah, I guess I should say it that way, right? Gregory no, no, it's, <laughs> it's just terrible. It's terrible. Um, so, so, you know, I, I, I got to know them in, in the, um, in the in the following years, I got to know them better and better. Nowadays, I work very closely with um, Andrea Navratil. I guess I should yeah. say it that way. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, we work, you know, she's uh, she continues to be a mentor of mine, and also we work hand in hand in, as she runs her singing circle, and I run mine, and we have um, uh, projects like that with um, you know funding from the Chori uh, Shandor Fund, um, and to run our our side by side singing circles and things like that. So. Um, you know, they all, each of these mentors has has played a very important role for me in in forming the way that I think about the style and um, calling into question, you know, some of the sort of mainstream misunderstandings that that people have. And I, I'm really eternally grateful to all of them because, as you said, in this style, it's of utmost importance. It's everything about how you learn about the style, rep, what your repertoire is, how you approach uh, the learning in terms of the methodology with which you learn and the methodology. With, with with which you teach so um yeah it, it it means a lot and it it's you know not a degree program but it's just as serious and rigorous wow we could really go deep into that one um in in terms of what each mentor might bring you because we would get we would all the listeners and me we'd all get some free advice here um you know, <laughs> but but I, I i wanted to i know i know this following point is is important uh, to you um which is which is, you know, integrating singing into our daily lives, mm -hmm. or at least this is something you learned visiting the villages. So let's let 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 me take you away from the city and start to talk a bit about your your visits to to the, the villages of Transylvania mm -hmm. and beyond. So, where, you know, basically, where have you gone? Who have you met? And what have you learned from these great people? Mm hmm. Um, yeah, I, I would say that all of the mentors that we've talked about really um, emphasized how important it is to go to the village and that even though, as you referenced, you know, there are a few people left and they're old and sick and dying, it, it, it it's true, but there are still people that you can learn from and it still is valuable even today. And we're not just saying 15, 20 years ago, but even right now, I, I still encourage uh, people to to go to the villages, even if it's not about learning a specific song or, or a group of songs, although it still can be uh, very much so about that, it, you're, you're making friendships with people and getting to know them and getting to know their lives. You're getting to know about the village life and 
for me, I, I find it absolutely fascinating to talk with people about the younger part of their life and how different village life was in the context in which these songs existed, you know, but of course, everyone asks different sorts of questions in these in these conversations, and you can talk with different people about different sorts of things, you know, some people are more interested in cooking or more interested in textiles or more interested in, in this or that. And there's just so much to learn if you're the kind of curious person that wants to know everything that's sort of immediately related to the style and not just the songs themselves. And like I said, you get to know the people, you get to know them really as people with their way of thinking, their way of looking at the world. It really does change, I think, what kind of person you are. If you're open to it, I certainly can say for myself, I've really changed a lot in terms of what kind of person I am from the Xena that arrived here back in 2006. So where, what are the, some of the top places or your favorite places that you have uh, visited in terms of the, mm -hmm. the, the villages? Yeah, I, I've visited quite a few places. I mean, just uh, in terms of the, the overview of the regions up north, um, former northern Hungary, now in Slovakia, and down in Dunantul, which is Transdanubia in English, and then in Transylvania, as you referenced, and, and also across the Carpathian Mountains to Moldova in English, Moldavia. Um, I would say some of the strongest um, impressions on me were from Deju Erzhinini, who's in Sovat. Um, which is in Mezushig in central Transylvania, and also uh, Tanko Esternini, who is in Gimesh, which is at the easternmost edge of Transylvania, into the Carpathian Mountains in that Gimesh Valley. Yep. Um, but but besides the two of them, there are of course so many other people and, and other places that that left strong impressions. But I've you know I, I counted at some point in the last couple of years, and I think I've been to maybe thirty five or forty different villages in a in a song collecting capacity. So how does that work? Like, I always thought about this, and I know each approach is different. And, you know, somebody shows up and uh, to, to my place, and let's say they say, Hi, I hear you know how to sing. Can you sing for me? Like, I know that's not <laughs> how it quite works. You need someone to introduce you to these people or take you there. Uh, like, like it, it's kind of, is it awkward? I remember, you know, mm -hmm. back in the day, they'd say, well, you'd have to get the, I mean, unless there's a, a wedding going on, or a baptism or some actual function to get these these musicians to play you know you just have mm -hmm. to get them super drunk and and you know bring some dancers <laughs> in and get, get them going so like how does this work with right. these nice these may or may not sweet be ladies between you as an instrumentalist and for me as a yeah. singer yeah. i haven't had the experience although there, there are, certainly are stories of people needing to be offered a little bit of um uh, you know alcohol to to wet their to get their pipes warm and ready to sing but um you know, it's um, it's true what you say about the awkwardness. I think you have to have a kind of a, a bravery about that, about knocking on a perfect stranger's door. Um, it's true that introductions can make an enormous difference. And the, the two women I just mentioned are both people that I met at the Ed Salam Tabor, which is the camp um, run by members of the Ed Salam uh, Ensemble, the band, um, which is in Vadoya every year in southern Hungary. Um, they, that's a camp in which they don't just teach the songs in a kind of Tansa's movement or revival way through the kind of urban singing teachers, but rather um, by bringing villagers, culture bearers, or practitioners, or whatever terminology you use, um, you know, to the camp to be there for the whole week. And so you spend a week learning from that person. You might learn, you know, 20, 40, 60 songs. And I'm not just making those numbers up. I have all these notebooks sitting here next to me where I'm sitting with, with the songs that I learned from them. And you really get to know them well, you know, as they talk about their life and their family and everything. And if you make a relationship with them, then maybe after that you can follow up and say, can I come visit you, you know, in the village that you're from at your home. Um, so that is, that's one path. And sometimes also there's a personal introduction in the place. But there are also people that I've met where it's just, walking down the street or knocking on a door. So hmm. those things are possible. Uh, you know, it's um, in terms of finding someone who really has a deep knowledge of the singing, of course, it, it is better to be arriving somewhere with a name or with some some kind of lead, you know, just going down the street um, doesn't always doesn't always work. But even then, you know, Agoch Kerge is someone who really emphasizes the importance of continuing to do that, because the only reason that we know the people that we know is because someone did just that. They walked yeah. around asking if anyone knew if anyone knows how to sing and you know it, this assumption like everyone has been found and every song has been heard it isn't really right and if you're a friendly and kind person and you just don't show up just kind of expecting to take but you you come to to make a relationship I think 
you know, you, you can do it. You just have to have a, a bravery to take that step. Um, there's this kind of premeditated notion or the preconceived kind of a conventional wisdom that the the one to learn to sing from in the village is the old lady. There's all, a lot of this old mm -hmm. lady and maybe old man, but mostly old lady thing. Mm -hmm. um, have you come across someone young who really got into it from the village? They still live in the village and they're and they're yeah. you know, continuing with it. There, there, there are some examples of, of people like that. Um, there are a handful of them, and of course we. We as a as a whole community absolutely treasure those people because it's such a, a rare and wonderful thing that someone is truly a, a culture bearer, an inheritor of the tradition within the village, as as you said, a younger generation. Um, I, I have met people like that, and often it's because the, the oldest lady in the village that's such a good singer's daughter or granddaughter learned the songs, you know. Right. So it's there's usually a pretty direct relationship with someone you know, of an older generation that they were able to learn from that's, you know, close within their family or something like that. But yes, there are a handful of examples and thank goodness that there are. Otherwise we would say it's, you know, completely gone, but it, but it isn't, or it won't be at least for at least a couple more generations. And right. Hopefully we can keep, Good. keep Good. reviving things. So. Yeah. We have that on the instrumental side, you know, we have the, the Kodo buzz or the, you know, uh, you know, uh, younger, call it Asegi musicians who are, thankfully still doing mm -hmm. it sas chavash you know is the right. typical example as well so that's good right. to hear on the singing side um Ogwich Gadigo's name comes up a lot and not just in this interview so far but in general i, I mm -hmm. was curious about something i heard recently a couple of uh, weeks ago that you know there was a young teenager who one who's interested in budapest to become a professional singer uh folk singer male folk singer i, I think out of every <laughs> Out of every 10 or even 15 uh, professional folk singers uh, or professional level folk singers or teachers in Hungary, uh, one might be a man. What? That's so interesting to me that uh, uh, that uh, you know that that exists and it's very rare. And I'm very happy to hear when when men want to you know uh, make a career of it or, or give it a shot, so to speak. What what's What's your view on that? I know you have some students who are who are who are men as well. And mm -hmm. what wh where is that? And, and by the way, the flip side's true in the on the mu musical. Excuse me, on the instrumental side, right? Most of mm -hmm. most of the instrumentalists happen to be men. So what's going on here? You think? Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's a complicated question to answer. <laughs> I'm not sure that I would be able to to do it justice. One thing I, I want to say before I forget to say this, that another name that should be mentioned here is Beretz Andrash. Oh, yeah. In terms of a, of a revival singer who's a man. Yes, um, true. And extremely accomplished in the style and very much worth listening to. There are, of course, others, so no offense. Oh, to there me. are many <laughs> others. I'm not oh, mentioning. No, sure, um, for sure. There are many others, but, yeah. But, um, but in terms of your question, obviously there are, are some traditions at play there in terms of instrumentalists, uh, primarily being men, in terms of in village practice instruments that were typically played by men. We can say that about you know the string instruments that you do, and, and like the Gimesh example that we were referencing earlier, that the often the violinist would have been, a, or the fiddler would have been a man, and then the Utigardon player would be his wife, right? Would be a woman. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there are some traditional uh, precedents there and instruments which don't feel in the community to be uh, suitable for women, for, for a lot of people. And um, in terms of the singing, it, I, I'm hesitating because there's just so many layers to this, to this question, really. But in terms of the singing, um, when you look at the collections, if you think well who was home at the some at the time that someone arrived home it could be that the men either are you know if you're talking about older generations they might have already been um sick or, or have passed or they might have not been at home at that time that collector mm. collector is coming to to record but also they might more so be the ones who remember the songs just because of the nature of how a women's life in traditional village life was was different from a man's um, if they were, you know, sitting in the evening phono or bujayash, the weaving or spinning circles, you know, singing the songs or singing the lullabies to their children or, or just generally being more oriented toward um, keeping, keeping the songs and passing them to the future generations. Um, of course, that 
isn't across the board at all. If we look at shepherd traditions where it might have been passed more so from father to son, that's a completely different context. So it's it's very hard to answer it in a kind of all across the board way because even just talking about different regions and different song types, it's really different. Um, but it is true that most of the participants in my classes are women, but there there are men as well, and they're very much welcome, young and old, and and at least in, in terms of my classes and in the classes in general here in Budapest, even if it's the minority, there's some very enthusiastic uh, male singers of, of all generations, and it's absolutely welcome. Hmm. I, I wanted to pause and just tell you or compliment you, uh, uh, it, your your terminology, your 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 um. Uh, your use of language is very careful and I really like it and I really like some of the terms <laughs> that you're using like culture culture bearer I really like that mm -hmm. one um, because there's this really bad translation that I see all the time where they call talk about a village informant you know yeah uh, who's supposed to be the the you know the well, the person that's doing the performing on the in the village collection, right? And they're informants, <laughs> like it's a science experiment, and you went to a lab, and they're giving you the information that you went there for. I, I, I yeah. also don't prefer using that term. <laughs> not in, not just that, but they they are they're also a uh, uh, they're informant for the KGB, you know. So that's even worse. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, I yeah. appreciate your 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 language. I've I've heard and seen some interviews with you, and some of them are in Hungarian, and I know the language there is. Is, is 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 tough to begin with and i certainly can't express myself in hungarian like i can in english but i really mm. I, and i hope the listeners are 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 on to this as well you're very careful and very very considerate choice of language um i i, I wanted to uh, and that's probably a san francisco thing of course i <laughs> <laughs> i wanted to um ask you some more about uh, 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 to just tie the bow on this you know uh, you you mentioned some settings and some some times when you know singing would be incorporated into village life and but how do you think mm -hmm. we might reflect on that today or, or utilize that today or bring that into our own lives mm -hmm. yeah i i think having an awareness and this is something that i really try to mention in my classes a lot so that we're not just sort of learning the songs in isolation and not having any idea of the context that they're coming from and the first thing, of course, to say is that there was singing literally from morning to night in traditional village life. And and in terms of the function, people were singing to process their grief or to sing their joys or to sing while they worked or to sing to flirt or to court or to communicate, to tell stories or to sing for partying. You know, Hungarian would sing lachang, right, to, to dance and have catharsis and party and to sing with friends. And they were singing during the harvest time. They were singing during the, I mentioned the evening, spinning or weaving, the phono or gujayash, um, evening handwork time, especially in this season in the winter, or at least this season in the northern hemisphere, right? The, the <laughs> cold months of the year. Yep. The people would gather together, you know, in the evening, not just for a couple hours, but for many hours to do their handwork together. And that's true all through the calendar of the year as there were all these different tasks to do that, that it was always accompanied by song, which of course kept people from being bored and also gave them a chance to communicate and tell stories, or like I said, to be playful or to process their grief. And of course, we also have separate plaintive songs, Kashyadagash, to specifically sing on your own, you know, to process your, your grief or lullabies that sing to your kids or songs you sing in, in community while dancing, you know, not just during the work, but also during the tans has, the regional tans has in the village or the Finally, are also these songs that are sung around the table after all those many hours of dancing uh -huh. in the wee hours. So, you know, if we look at just how many settings in which people were singing, any given villager might have known dozens or hundreds of songs. It's a huge repertoire of melodies and texts that were right at their disposal. And that's, that's an emotional toolbox that you can use when you need it, you know, for communication, for processing, for joy for expressing your values, your way of seeing the world, the knowledge that you have about how things work, and, and also all the imagery that goes with all of that, the sort of, you know, cultural symbolism and metaphors and the, and the poetry that's passed down in those texts over the many generations. And there's, there's space there, too, for that individual creativity and improvisation to, to play with that text a little bit, to add in, a, you know, a new bit here or there and a variation. And so I guess I'm saying all of that to say that there's a real function for it. And if we see that and we see that we don't necessarily have those tools, that we look at, well, how, how is it different for us now if we have these emotions and we're, we're processing them without those tools? And maybe we see singing more as something that, you know, one talented 
you know, star does on a stage, you know, a, a famous singer and everyone else is in the audience. That's a radically different relationship with singing. And that shift from active to passive or one person can, you know, out of 100 people, one person can sing the other 99 are audience or consumers, you know, instead of in this traditional life I'm talking about where most people or almost all people were singing actively all through the day. Um, so I, I just, I encourage people to really reflect on that, on what songs they know and what songs they have in common, you know, with their friends, their their relationship with their own voice and, and whether they feel that desire to sing. That's something that we talk a lot about. We mentioned Agoj Kerge and others, and, and he also talks about it. it's not just that people aren't singing folk songs anymore. They're just not singing at all. And yeah. that's really something to, to reflect on, you know, how much our lifestyle has changed and and what we might do to to shift that back you know as these evening activities have changed from weaving together to watching netflix you know by ourselves and sort of being like sort of social with our our family or our friends or neighbors you know that there are these major lifestyle changes and and our energy changes in terms of expressing ourselves through through song i know that's sort of a long no, answer but this, i hope i'm well i'm yeah. I, I i you're onto something i mean folk singing as a form of therapy is what i'm hearing right and yeah and a, and yeah. a radical shift from basically an active relationship with expression and so being active and expressive and social to being more passive and isolated and a consumer of music so it's a very different relationship yeah is, is this something that you've kind of discovered on your own or or is this something that uh you've learned through your mentors because this is a po pretty powerful notion i don't think it's come up yet on this program talking with anybody mm -hmm. how this is almost like a therapeutic thing um mm -hmm. but 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 you know no, it, it's absolutely yeah. something i've seen through the eyes of my mentor so okay. i would in no way take credit for this idea uh -huh. um so it's something that they absolutely have um emphasized many times and and i can absolutely see it through the work that i've been doing this last 15 years very powerful well let's let's talk about your teaching uh because it sounds like uh people can get a a lot out of this not just learning <laughs> tunes um so the nape doll could or the folk singing mm -hmm. circle uh you started mm -hmm. it i guess uh, in san francisco in around 2010 um right. how did it come come out uh, well you know the, the, the how did the launch come about who first started what you know where it's going now and i definitely want to talk about your upcoming classes that start very soon mm -hmm. Here in January mm -hmm. 2022, but but it, they're always going on. So talk talk to me about uh, take me back to 2010. Now 21 years ago, 22 years ago, Zena, if you could. Believe. No, no, that's <laughs> no, not that's dark. 11 that's years e ago. 11 yeah. years ago. Sorry. Now I'm yeah. now I'm aging myself. 11 years ago. Yeah. No. So basically, you know, I I had moved to Hungary as we talked about. I had been immersed in the style for a few years, and I I I needed to move back to the United States. And I wanted to continue studying. So I was looking for, for sort of for a Fabian Eva in California, mm -hmm. um, which, of course, there isn't. But I, you know, I, I looked, um, um, you know, at that point, I had awareness that there was a local Hungarian community and um, reached out to them and asked who I could learn songs from. And there was a folk dance group. Um, the, the couple of people who sang in it weren't, weren't active as singing teachers. And they had learned sort of through the Tanz has movement. And there were people that were sort of scattered about, but basically you know, it, it came into the conversation like, well, why don't you lead? Why don't you teach what you, you know, have learned there in Hungary? You're bringing back all these recordings. We haven't heard these recordings and you're a trained musician. And, and you know, I, I felt honestly quite self-conscious at that time because I thought, well, okay, these are, you know, Hungarian Hungarians who immigrated from Hungary as adults mostly. And, um, you know, here I am sort of this, you know, relative newcomer, newcomer to the style. And, you know, the idea that I would teach at that point seemed ridiculous. But I, I immediately saw the value in it in the sense that I'm just functioning as a liaison, which actually is exactly what um, many people saw the need for within the Tansas movement here in Hungary, that, you know, you have this village practitioner or culture bearer, as we talked about, whether it's a living person or a recording, and you have... Um, in the case here in Hungary of the Tansas movement, you have urban folk and, and you need someone in between, or in my case, either uh, Hungarians in the diaspora or non-Hungarians in the diaspora. And that basically you need a person that sort of serves as a bridge or a liaison between those two things and sort of translates, so to speak, not necessarily language wise, but sort of translate the song in the sense of explaining it, talking about it, maybe breaking it down musically, carrying that information across. And, um, 
So it started out, there were a group of, like I said, Hungarians that were in California, and we would just sit together, you know, once a week in the evenings. And of course, right away, I wanted to create an open group that was for anyone who wasn't in the Hungarian community. It was important to me to sort of create the space that I had been looking for, you know, while I was still in California, you know, doing that search we talked about following Oberlin and create a real safe space where it's okay if you don't know anything and, and you can ask any question you have and we'll just start with a map of Hungary. I mean, that's really how we started every mm-hmm. single class back in those days and I and I still do it now, you know, pull up the map and, and it's, you know, to say that it's not a clique or a club, it's not for Hungarians only, it's not for trained musicians only, but um, it's very friendly and welcoming and accessible and 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 it was true even back at that time that of course having that musical background meant that I could talk about it in certain terms, you know, use that terminology. But mostly we followed the exact teaching methodology that I had learned from Eva here at the Obuda School ABK. Yep. We've talked about you know just playing the village recording and repeating back line by line and really teaching it orally. So. Um, so that, yeah. So, so that was that's the beginnings of it. Right, and that that happened in San Francisco. Um, and then when you moved to Budapest, this is pre-pandemic, obviously, was there a, mm-hmm. like, in series, in-person classes, or did you start going online already then to, to, to keep, mm-hmm. keep up with your San Francisco students? Right, so the, the San Francisco group basically, you know, that had, um, that had grown and evolved, and I, I basically ran that weekly for, for that seven or eight years, and in addition, the weekly class also did, you know, like, different seasonal events and performances and things like that, so it was um, quite an established thing at the time that I moved back to Hungary, and, and during those years, I was coming back to Hungary in the summers and, you know, gathering hundreds of songs, then coming back and teaching them all year, and I was going to these archives we were just talking about online and spending my mornings in California on Skype with the, with the mentors that were here in Hungary in their evening in, in Budapest time, and and so that's how those years had gone, and it was it was sad to leave it, but I really was uh, wanting more. I really, you know, wanted more time living here, and those those summers and those Skype calls just weren't enough for yeah. me. And and so um, I came back. I was asked by the Heritage House to teach a class there, and then I got a grant, which as as mentioned before, with Andrea Navratil, and and uh, it's so funny to say her name in English like that, and. Um, <laughs> And so we, you know, we ran in-person classes because, as you said, this is you know, before the pandemic. And and then, um, you know, and I taught at other institutions uh, here in, in Hungary. And um, and then COVID started, and I, I just immediately from one week to the next, you know, back in March 2020, just took it online with the current group that I had had at that moment here in Budapest, you know, the weekly class. And... Um, and then because we were online here in the evening, of course, that's North America, morning to midday, depending on which coast you're on. And so, you know, I already had those relationships and I, you know, sent a note to everyone going, well, if you'd like to join us, here we are, we're all in lockdown, you know, at the beginning of COVID, we're all at home and and feel free to join us. And so it just, it got much bigger very quickly. You know, it went from you know the five, ten, fifteen people to twenty and twenty-five, and Amazing. then it split into two groups, and then it split into three groups, and then it split into five groups, and then six groups. You know, so wow. pretty soon it was like the New Zealand Australia group and the Hong Kong Taiwan group, and the you know two different days of the week. You know, and then the weekend class, and the, you know, so um, it's not it's not as wild as that anymore. But it, but um, you know, it was. A beautiful thing to see well right this is the very logical extension of this because of course there's people all over the world not just in the Bay Area or wherever I had you know I had traveled before for if there was festivals or things like that but um, but you know there are people that are in rural areas that don't have a Hungarian house or a festival or something where there would be that opportunity and you know they've been looking at for something like this many of them for um, you know, years or decades, and other people were in other areas where maybe they have a folk dance group, but they don't have a singing teacher, and so it just made a lot of sense, and even now, regardless of what happens with COVID going forward, I, I plan to continue doing it because it, it's a very logical thing to be offering, um, I think, for people all over the place. Well, you've got an elegant solution. If if you go on uh, xenobuzoi.com, you'll, you'll see the the, the class offerings that are coming up, for instance, it's uh, Songs of mm-hmm. Kolotosek series. There's six classes every Tuesday. And then, you know, you, you actually have, you run two separate classes. Uh, and it's so uh, one in the morning, your time, and then the evening, uh, your time. So it works for no matter what time zone you're in, which I know is tough to navigate here. Um, so right. 
but it works for everybody. And I see you have participants from Sydney, Christchurch, Hong Kong, England, California, New York, you know, all those various um, time zones, right? England, right. Israel, it even says Israel. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So there's there's people from from all over in the classes, and it's really a joy. It's really wonderful, you know, singing with them every week and and having those two different groups. And yes, just as you said, it's going to be Kolota Seg now, um, from January 18th for six weeks, and then from uh, beginning of March through mid April, it's Mezushig, and then from late April through end of May, uh, Kukulimanti is usually how people refer to it, or Maros Kukulukvideka. Um, so basically covering kind of central uh, Transylvania, so both more right. um, more northern and southern parts of that western half of Transylvania, and then later next year we'll, we'll do eastern Transylvania. Um, this past fall we learned songs from Transdanubia and from Moldova, so I always try to you know, do a six-week class focused on a given region, so that's what's coming up now. And they are about 90 minutes each, uh, right, uh, the classes? Mm -hmm. And uh, right. I see the, uh, like, a, uh, you could play for the full class, it's 10,000 footings, Right. Uh, anyway, for like well, if you're in session. Hungary, yeah. right. So I, I have it sliding scale because you know that's one of the interesting questions that happened as we went online. Right, is that people are joining from such different economies and trying to find a way to make that be fair. So I tried to find the fairest solution that I could yeah. um, by making making a sliding scale. And yeah, people can drop in and just pay for one class, or they can pay for the whole series. And and we always work it out too. If someone you know can't afford it, then we do work exchange and things like that. Unfortunately, there are plenty of people who come who pay the maximum of that sliding scale and know that they're they're helping to, to subsidize someone else. So it really all works out. Yep. And um, and you know, like I said, it's it's all these village recordings that we use. It's really important to me um, that it's high quality material. So there's there's kind of the two parts. You know, I mentioned the the friendly, welcoming, accessible part, and and I'd say the other part of my orientation is that. I'm really providing a, a, a quality class in the sense that I spent a lot of time choosing the songs and gathering a lot of various recordings from the archives of these songs, typing up the song words and gathering various text variations and translating them and researching the background information around the song, you know, if it's tied to a custom or a dance or a seasonal practice or there's background information about the source singer or the region. So basically in the classes, you know, I, it's just to say that there's a strict standard in terms of what I present and that I have all that information for any given song that, you know, and the participants learn all of that about all the songs that they learn. So it's not sort of like a casual, like, come join and sing. It's it's really um, yes. thorough in terms of that information I, 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 around hey, each song. Hey, Oberlin, I don't expect anything less. Um, <laughs> uh, the, uh, you know, people will learn pronunciation and vocabulary. Um, this right. is going to, you know, give confidence in your singing and even uh, strengthen your your vocal skills. And you learn about geography and history and about traditional life. So it's really seems like a wonderful thing. I know you have some, you know, you have private offerings as well and and all other stuff. Great, great things on your website. It's a fantastic website. Um, and, and and Zena is available for people to 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 reach out to, you know, to just to, to chat and, and if you want to schedule a. a, a something to the countryside, she probably set you in the right direction. So we have some wonderful <laughs> thing, uh, you know, some resources with her. Now that's the, that's the Napedal Kud. Your other project is Vodalmo, mm -hmm. Wild Apple. Mm -hmm. That was my nickname in high school, by the way. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I, I certainly was not. This is a, a very interesting band, which, which um, it's, uh, there's three of you. It's a trio. You're the singer mm -hmm. and I, I, you also play some Ute Gordon, right? Percussive cello. Uh, with the mm -hmm. band, and you have a violinist called Matthew Sem Semelo. Zemela. Is he Hungarian? Zemelo. He's not Hungarian, it's just an SZ, but no, Zemela. Yeah, and oh. Michel Kalikulo. Who's Uzbek, right? Uzbekistan right. born cellist. Um, mm -hmm. So, this is, so you you gotta tell me how y'all met. And how does this work logistically? I mean, you're you're in Budapest, and the, the other two, I suppose, are in California. What's going? How does how, how did you all come together, and when? Right. No. So right. This this uh, was born before me moving back to Hungary. So um. So it was it was born in California, and basically it grew out of the story that I was just telling about the beginnings of the singing circle, in the sense that, you know, I wanted to share what I had learned here in Hungary, and I. Um, you know, was was happy to be offering the classes. But as you know, not everybody feels 
you know, brave enough to show up at a singing class, especially because, you know, it's in person, everyone can hear you sing, right? And, um, and yeah, there were a good number of people who were interested in hearing the songs, but wouldn't necessarily come to a singing class. And I, I saw the, um, the need there for sharing. And it, there were various Hungarian events, you know, for holidays like March 15th or October 23rd, things like that. And they would invite me to come sing. And I would sing, you know, solo, just a, a few songs for a few minutes, because there isn't a local band, as you know, in the barrier, what there wasn't at that time. And for some of the bigger events, they would fly down. Um, Orban Lazzi with Forash Banda from yeah. Seattle, Vancouver, and and um, you know for other events I would just sing a cappella, and then people started asking me, oh, "Can't you give a concert?" And I go, "Well, uh, you know, yeah, but I don't have a band, and I'm not going to sit sit there just singing solo for an hour, and <laughs> you know, but I but I do want to share these songs, and I understand that there are people who just want to hear them and not necessarily come to a singing class, so." Basically, I went, okay, well, you know, Zina, come on, you know, use the resources at your disposal. There's just got to be some way to frame the songs or accompany them if you don't have a local band. And I I came to the realization that, well, you know, I'm not from Transylvania. This is my village. I'm from San Francisco. I'm in a, you know, if if I were living in a village anywhere, you, you use what's on hand, right? If you've got just a violinist, well, that's what you've got. If you've got a flute player, if you've got a sax player, well, that's what you have. And so, you know, I sort of realized that I wanted to just you know use use what i had at my disposal there to to be able to share these songs and to highlight their beauty and and you know some of these songs actually don't have traditional accompaniment so you know for for those songs just to give them some kind of a frame or support and and that's also the way that i had learned a lot of the songs even the ones that do have traditional accompaniment if it's if it's in that context where there is a a traditional band, you know, I hadn't actually learned them that way because as we've told the story, right, I, I didn't come to this as being, for example, a folk dancer in the um, Tansaz movement. I really was learning all these songs from these acapella recordings. So in my mind, I had a sort of a, a fantasy, you know, a way I imagined them being framed and the, and the musical aspects of the songs that I found especially beautiful, you know, for one song, maybe the intonation, for another song, the rhythm, another song, with something else. And so I, I went, okay, I'm going to find some musicians who can help me create this frame. And so I developed these arrangements, and I'm so thankful to have met Matt and Misha because they're just absolutely fantastic musicians, and they were absolutely open-minded to learning the songs, whether I was writing out with classical notation or whether I was having them learn it orally from the source recordings or whether I was describing it using metaphors and symbolic language. They really were, were open to the project and open to improvising and um so it for me it became a sort of dream come true mm -hmm. that i could let my fantasy in my mind sound out loud and and we focused on i'm saying in the past because i'm talking about the years there in california but yeah, yeah. um you know pre-covid but um but basically you know from the very beginning focused on performing at a variety of venues for a variety of audiences because as you know a lot of hungarian bands in the diaspora you know are focused more so on the Magyar has the hungarian heritage house or cultural houses in various cities or the festivals and things like that and, and that makes absolute sense that that is that way so i don't mean any criticism in in any sense yeah. and basically our goal was to play for those communities and with those in those communities and also to reach out to wider audiences you know a lot of people at various different local you know smaller venues who had never heard music before and i say smaller venues because i was and still am really focused on intimate listening spaces because what we play as the trio really is listening music it's not a big party dance band and um you know we do have some some tunes like that but Essentially, it's listening music, and we really enjoy playing the kind of spaces where you can get that sitting at the kitchen table kind of feeling. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we have had to take a, a break now during COVID. It was great to go back to California this summer, and we had a mm. gig there, and it was wonderful. So hoping to, you know, continue, and obviously I'm from here working on the material for the second album, but, but we do have a CD that we recorded here in Budapest, fortunately, pre-COVID, and and so that's also on the on the website that you mentioned. So if you right. want to check it out. And, and, and Matt and Misha have been over to Budapest to perform, right? I know. Of, of, of Fono they and, have, yeah. yeah. They came over to, that's right, they came over to record the album. And we played at Fono, which is a well-known music hall here in Buda. And um, and then when the CD came out, they, they also came back. And we had another performance there at Fono and also in Transylvania and in Debrecen. And, um, you know, they're obviously open to doing more of that. It's just COVID has kind of, you know, sure. gotten in the way. But um, but I have faith that we'll be able to continue in it. And it is a joy for me to to kind of bring that composition background that we talked about into the work because, 
you know, really I had kept those worlds separate. You know, mm-hmm. I obviously really respect the traditional practice and I'm I'm not really in a world music uh, sort of mentality with it. So I know you were saying fusion, but I, I, I really am very careful about how I create the accompaniment for the songs and, and yes. careful about how I talk about it, as you mentioned too, in the sense of right. you know, if people come to hear it at a concert, to not just kind of go, these are Hungarian folk songs, even though it's completely not traditional accompaniment. You know, if that's what it is, then I'm gonna let them know that that's what it is. So they know what they're hearing. And I think that's an issue that we all really need to focus on in this revival movement. Because a lot of times you hear things that are really not traditional and if someone doesn't introduce it that way how would someone know the difference and they just think that you know that that's what it is traditionally so as you know i put a focus on articulating it so we know what we're hearing wonderful well let me let me play a little clip i got i found something on youtube uh you were performing in 2017 uh, in berkeley at this uh, uh, intimate venue called fifth street farms and i'll play a little um uh 30 minute 40 or 30 30 40 second uh, clip here of, of one of your songs, which I think is called Vadalma, right? Is the song called Vadalma? Let's see. Uh, I, think I would it call is. it Ashikashu because Ashikashu. that's the, the beginning of it. Yeah. Okay, so here. Nice, nice bootleg there of Zina, <laughs> Zina singing with the Matt and Misha Vodalmo. Very nice. Um, th- th- so check, check. There's there there are some clips of you guys I know uh, on YouTube, um, but uh, there's a recording as well, which I think is available on mm-hmm. Spotify. I would presume. I don't know. Uh, it should be probably, <laughs> but it's not. Uh, oh, okay. But you can't find it on my website. Is the best place. There you go. To find okay. It. Yeah. Well, wonderful. Yeah. So, and, and thank you for, yeah. for playing the clip. And I would say, you know, for those who don't speak Hungarian, it's, it has a beautiful text. I don't know if you'd like me to translate because it's a lovely example of the poetry we were talking about. Yes, actually. please. Can you? Yeah. So the, the clip you just played, I was singing across the water. There's a wild apple tree, which, as you said, is the name of our group. So it has okay. Paloma right there in the first line um, of that of the part that you played. So across the water, there's this wild apple tree and on its top three red apples and one among them falls into the mud. He or she who picks it up doesn't pick it up in vain. I picked one up and washed it of its mud and I'll never leave my longtime love. There you go. Pick- so it's absolutely beautiful yes. idea that love is worth it, right? Like yes. you're not literally talking about an apple. The apple is the sweetheart, right? And to wash it of its mud and to treasure it, um, it's, a beautiful way of articulating that beautiful and, and and the layering of the arrangements great and i'm so happy you found this medium where all these year, you know decades of technical training you had early on or two decades you know now come come up come out very respectfully mixing the two um you know the, your passion for hungarian folk music and your passion for composition um and not a like you, you, you will. I know you do speak in between numbers, and you put context to it. And with your careful mm-hmm. use of language, I'm sure that comes very, uh, uh, comes across uh, very well. So, um, oh, I, we we hope to hear a lot more from Vodalm in the years to come. I know it's hard right now, but but um, I wanted to talk. You know, as we kind of start closing in on the end here, you're mm-hmm. involved in some very important things, in my view, um, about. You know, working with the Her- Heritage House, which is the Hagyo mm-hmm. Manyo Kazo, uh, in in mm-hmm. trying to deliver Hungarian folk culture to to you know more international or non-Hungarian speaking uh, audiences, mm-hmm. um, can you give us some examples of some of the uh, the, the projects that you've been working on uh, recently? Mm-hmm. Um, well, there's there have been a number of different things over the years, but. Um, Recently, things like um, there's a, what they call an international portfolio, which you probably more likely call a roster of bands um, that they uh, selected, who are mostly younger bands um, who are very well known here in Hungary, performing uh, mostly traditional Hungarian folk music, but from, from a variety of, of traditions within the whole Carpathian Basin, and um, and basically mentoring them in their English language materials. 
but um, but in that process also kind of talking about how how to give for example if you're giving a concert how to how to talk during the concert exactly the the kinds of um, uh, talking that you were just talking about that I do with Vodalma right the the little um, introductions and things between songs and 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 how to make that understandable uh, for an international audience so it's really not just a language question but understanding the kind of information that that people need which is something that I've you know been able to see through these years of teaching so I, I really do think of it as wow. sort of an educational that's so opportunity Im- right so important um, oh my god that's so important so this they, they, could, they could translate that into when they're speaking in Hungarian as well right but what to say how to say how to put it into context Right. For, right. Yeah. Oh my God. Right. So, and and how yeah. and what you what you're saying about careful wording, right? How to really articulate these different regions? What kind of terminology would or wouldn't be familiar to people? What kinds of references they may or may not have, and um, or stereotypes that you may or may not want to help them undo. You know that sort of thing. Or even just, I mean, to go back to the very beginning, I often start by just defining what a folk song is in my teaching context, and sometimes in concert settings too. A lot of people have a very different idea. If you say folk music and, you know, they might think singer-songwriter with a guitar and you've got to go back to this is oral tradition passed down over the generations, you know, not learned in music school, just learned um, in everyday life like a mother tongue. And just talking about about those kinds of things can seem so basic, but it can be absolutely um, transformative for, for people who haven't been exposed to that way of thinking about music and the kinds of things we talked about in terms of function, like you said, therapy and yeah. in everyday life. So, um, so anyway, so that's one project is mentoring. Um, the Heritage House sent me to Portugal a couple months ago to represent them and to represent Hungarian folk music more generally at Womex, which is the World Music Expo. It's the biggest yeah. um, world music and traditional music conference every year in the world. Um, they now have a change of leadership, and we're going to be developing a new international department. So they've turned to me to help them develop the conceptualization for that international uh, department. And um, trying to think of what other kinds of projects. Well, for example, sometimes other things come together with the Heritage House too, like the Fulbright um, Foundation contacted me to provide lectures and a folk singing class for their Fulbright scholars that are here in Hungary. And so we'll do that at the Heritage House, for example. Mm. Um, So I work with a lot of different institutions. There's also another one that's opening, which I'm sure you've heard about, the Mogyar Zenehaza, which is the House of Hungarian Music, which is unfortunately quite a similar name in English, um, (laughs) which is now opening on the other side of town, way over in Pest. this month, and so they've also asked me to teach a series of folk singing classes there this spring with their grand opening. And um, so I try to work with a lot of different institutions, and they, you know, sort of they ask for different things, but usually mm-hmm. the similar things to what we talk about. Um, in the online classes happen in the online classes. Sometimes there's also lectures uh, besides the singing teaching on on the quen- kinds of things that we've talked about. Hey, you know, um, when you so. teach in Budapest, is it in English? Oh, it's a, yeah, oh. all of, all of these situations we're talking about are in English, and that really is my specialty. So, you yeah. know, if I'm teaching up at the American school, it's it's exactly for this reason. They need someone who's a you know fluent English speaker, um, who is a specialist in this style. And same thing with the Fulbright scholars. Same thing with the um, the cl- class at the Heritage House or at the House of Hungarian Music, uh, which is you know to have a class that's accessible to you know non-Hungarian speakers who are living here in Hungary. There's a big community of expats from all over the world living here and. Um, and I will say that even if it's designed that way, there are always Hungarians who come to participate as well, who speak Hungarian, but who also speak English and want to hear it from that point of view or um, are interested in all these matters of translation or hearing the songs really broken down. There actually aren't that many places for adults to learn Hungarian folk singing in a really detailed way mm-hmm. in Budapest, which is something I hope we can continue to work on as a movement because there are a lot of opportunities for kids in school and the Obu, Obuda Folk Music School that we talked about. And there's singing teaching at the beginning of a Tansaz, for example, but um, besides the degree programs, like at the Zen Academia, the Music List Academy that we talked about, um, there aren't really places that really do in-depth training for adults. So there are a fair number of, of Hungarian Hungarians who also join my classes. Mm. What? Let me just back up a bit. <clears throat> what are the, mm-hmm. you know, when you coach or mentor these bands and performers, you know, mm-hmm. in terms of kind of explaining, putting it to context, bringing, and, and even potentially with the ultimate goal of bringing Hungarian folk music to a wider uh, audience or wider stage, 
And what are the key mm-hmm. components that you, the principles maybe that you're guided by when, when you're thinking about, okay, how do I, what do I coach these guys to say and these gals to say about a number they might be performing? Because I could tell you my situation, you know, as the mm-hmm. leader of Yonta, you know, and, and, and mm-hmm. the Eletfa before that, you know, <clears throat> it, it's really a challenge sometimes to what am I going to say about we're going to play something from sake. Okay. Well, am I mm-hmm. going to go into the Saxon thing? Am I going going into the, this used to be a big city and multicultural, now it's a smaller, you know, like, or am I just going to talk about the three strings on the bass or what am I going to talk about? It's mm-hmm. so much. And ultimately then I'm like tongue tied. I don't know what the hell to say because, <laughs> you know, so, so how do you, how do you kind of approach that particularly with instrumental music, with the singing, you mm-hmm. might be able to talk about what these lyrics mean, but uh, can mm-hmm. you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, if I were mentoring you, it sounds like yes. it sounds like your issue is a, is a planning issue, right? Yeah. So it, um, I have <clears> found <throat> it important in my work with Valdoma to consciously decide before the concert what I'm going to talk about about each song, because just like you said, with any given song, you could talk about the region, you could talk about the instruments, you could talk about the song lyrics, and if you talked about all of those things, you'd be talking for 20 minutes before the five-minute song, and that wouldn't yes. really work in terms of proportions in the concert. Right. So I go through the set list um, and make conscious choices. Okay, what are the songs with great lyrics that I'm going to highlight? Of course, all of them have beautiful lyrics, and it's a hard choice, but you've got to make your choices, right? So you pick, okay, these are the handful of verses that I'm going to translate out of these given songs, You know, maybe these couple of songs have an interesting other instrument. Let's say there's a song from Southern Chisnubia with long flute, and that's something special you talk about in that song, or it's from Moldova, and you've got kobos, and you talk about that instrument for that song. So there's a given song with a particular instrument, like you said, the three-string viola, there's a song where that's going to be especially able to be heard or highlighted, or it's not going to have a solo in that particular case. But, you know, if that's the song where the audience is really going to be able to hear that instrument clearly, and maybe in your arrangement, then, then I would introduce that instrument before that song. So basically just consciously making the choice ahead of time which introductions you're going to be giving to which songs or song sets. And oh. rehearsing saying that intro rather than trying to just improvise it on the spot. Yeah. You'll come up with your one or two sentences and actually practice saying them before you get up on the stage, even if it's your native language. <laughs> right, so, right. Well, I, yeah. I, okay, so far I, I do try to do that when it's possible. Um, right. You know, what I, what I have found has been the most effective storytelling is mm-hmm. connecting somehow with the emotion of the moment, uh, the, the emotion of the piece. Um, you know, Sas Chavash. Mm-hmm. When I play Sas Chavash, they played at my wedding. Like, you know, those guys were at my wedding. Now, right. now half of them right. are, are dead. Like, like and, and I do the same know. thing. If I learned a song from a specific yes. person, I really like to talk about that person, where <clears throat> they live, what I learned for them, or what kind of person they are. And exactly as you said, if it's a specific type of song, like a ballad or a grieving song, you got to talk about what the song is about. Otherwise, they're just hearing it and not making that emotional connection. You know, if you're giving the introduction before the song, you're giving them an opportunity as they're listening to really connect with it on a much deeper level than just, oh, it's a pretty song in minor. No, this is a ballad about three orphans and their, you know, the <laughs> woes of their life. And, you know, yeah. here's the detailed and, and, you know, unbelievably visceral song text. And so then as they're listening, I'm thinking of an audience that's largely non-Hungarian speaking, you know, as they're listening and they can really be taking that in um, mm. on an emotional, psychological, spiritual level. Right. Well, great advice. Um, the the uh, the Hungarian Heritage House, Hagyományok Kaza. I know the new leadership. I think uh, Miklos Bot, right, is the new mm-hmm. the the new guy in That's charge. Right. And and so uh, you mentioned this international portfolio or international like roster. What, mm-hmm. what uh, can you give some examples of the bands that have been selected for that? And then what is the ultimate goal to do with them? To get them all over the world playing? To make them more popular domestically? What's the plan? It's very, it sounds very interesting. Mm-hmm. I wasn't aware of this. Yeah, I mean, that project is actually coming to a close this month. It's been, um, those bands were selected a couple of years back. And then, as you know, as we talked about COVID and everything that's happened in the meantime, but basically the Heritage House supported them in, um, you know, booking them at some various musical and traditional world music festivals. They provided them mentoring, like the mentoring to me that I was just talking about, and other sorts of uh, resources and things like that. It's bands like Tazlo, Babra, um, Debreceni Kish Helga, who's a zither player, um, 
you know, a number of, like I said, more so for that particular roster, younger bands is not necessarily representative of sort of the top bands in Hungary in that particular case, because you have more established bands, of course, like Mujikash or Fono Zenakar. Yeah. Um, so it, you know, but the, but of the um, sort of younger generation, they're, they're very active bands uh, as both stage performers and, um, and at playing at Tanz houses and events and festivals like that. So kind of, you know, like booking ready bands who are able to go touring abroad and everything in terms of where they are in their, in their lives and their careers too. Um, so, but I'm, I'm very curious to see what kinds of things will happen now. The new leadership and new chapter at the Heritage House, you know, it's the 20 year anniversary and how going forward, what are the next steps? And um, Miklos uh, definitely has an orientation toward international um, collaborations and so you know it, there's some possibilities in terms of how things could could develop and and I hope to you know keep playing a, a big role in that I'm honored that they've invited me to to help them develop that vision and you know to the extent that I can continue to make m- more accessible programming for diaspora like many of the listeners of this program I, I hope to keep doing that and do it on a, on a bigger level in collaboration with them, right? I hope you keep doing it um, for sure. And I know Kelam and Laszlo has been great and, and both Miklos, you know, just so people know, I mean, he's like a wild guitarist, electric guitarist uh, <laughs> uh, who who plays like the meanest Kalotasegi on his guitar. Um, th- this is kind of a, you know, a little more maybe, maybe forward thinking and progressive uh, uh, type of musician. And I'm very curious what he might do in this management role, and I and I and I know you'll be, you'll 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 be a part of that hopefully. Um, and I know there's been some amazing like during the pandemic too, like the videos, the performances, mm-hmm. the concerts. I mean, we we did and that's a, something else yeah. that he was involved in is the Polyphony Project. If our listeners might be interested in checking that out, um, the Polyphony Project is focused on Ukrainian singing, but it's something yes. that he was involved with and absolutely beautiful video work in making the same archival recordings that we've been talking about, which, you know, historically have been just audio recordings, whether people were using wax cylinders or, or little um, digital recorders or whatever they were using, those are generally just audio recordings. And, and uh, he uh, was part of making this archive a very visually beautifully done uh, video source recordings. So you can go to the Polyphony mm-hmm. Project. I don't know if it's .com or .web, but if you Google that, um, you can see it. And so that's sort of a model that we hope to turn into an international uh, platform for um, these kinds of archives. Do you still play the piano or the horn? Um, I do. I, no, I don't play horn anymore. Um, that was, like I said, was sort of, <laughs> sort of in a way, an accidental instrument for me, just because like right. there was a need for a horn player in the band. But um, uh, even though I ended up playing it for many years, but I, no, piano is still my primary instrument, and I and I have taught piano over the years as well. Um, and I play, you know, it's my it's my main instrument if I'm developing a company for a song, and um, you know, mm-hmm. I enjoy playing it at home, and I I still do write piano pieces, but I haven't been, you know, sort of active as a performer or having those pieces performed recently but but yeah. yes you know it's my it'll always be my sort of native instrument in a way well have you been tempted to pick up the uh, accordion and 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 you know play along with a colota segi or a sentivani mm. with the chords that's interesting no you know i i haven't felt the drive to play accordion although okay. it's a good question I, I have thought about other sort of keyboard um uh, related instruments but i but no i you know I, a lot of people ask me why i don't accompany myself and just give solo concerts where i'm accompanying myself on piano with the folk songs but for me it's so strongly associated with the classical world it, it's not the um the sound world that that i'm going for and, and that's why as i was saying i'm so thankful to have matt and misha because with the strings they can really go back and forth between the worlds in terms of you know, having elements of the accompanying be traditional, like a traditional string player, and then have elements of it more like that classical sound world um, with the pizzicato or long drones or things like that. So I, I really love that flexibility. And for me, the piano, it, it, it just doesn't have it because there's no <laughs> piano in village music. So, um, yeah, it's, yeah, I, yeah. So you don't even play it in the, like you won't bring a keyboard up to the concert or something. Um, because no. because it gets in the way of the, the the aesthetic you're going for clearly right so yeah yeah, yeah it's never it, it literally has never happened I, it it makes sense. never in that it never has even occurred to me I use it as a tool you know I yeah. use it for myself to develop my ideas develop the arrangements to show the guys what I want them to do and um, and then we take it from there so nice yeah well 
Um, I've had a really interesting uh, last 90 minutes talking to you and getting to know you. <laughs> and, you know, our paths do, do cross, though we haven't personally yet. But I, I, I see a lot of promise, um, you know, for the future of singing and learning and, and getting closer to the folklore again. Uh, through through your work, uh, you're a you know a very forward thinking person, and I'm really happy you're involved at the uh, really the highest levels of this cultural diplomacy back uh, back in Budapest as well. So for me, that's very very important. Uh, I'll I'll give you the 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 last word before before we sign off. You know, I don't know anything, any big message you want to send out to the world through Tansa's talk. Oh, thank you. I, well, thank you for having me. First of all, it's been an interesting last ninety minutes for me as well, and I and I really appreciate you know, the opportunity to be able to share about what I do. And and it, it is an honor, as you said, to be working with these sort of top institutions and, and cultural diplomacy is a, is a good way to word it. If I'm able to serve in this capacity as sort of a bridge or a gateway, you know, um, then I'm happy to be able to, to serve in that way. And I think that's what I would emphasize here at the end, just in terms of the singing circle and the upcoming classes that in terms of who participates in the classes, you know, we talked about countries and, and you know, that's all these different people from all these countries around the world. And even in terms of the uh, North American community, which we talked about earlier as well, in terms of the beginnings of the scene circle, as you know, I don't know in Canada what the numbers are, but in the U.S. <laughs> where I'm from, you know, there's over a million and a half people of Hungarian descent and only about 5% of those people speak Hungarian. And mm-hmm. for that well over a million people to have access to learning about the um, kind of music that their family you know, comes from. For a lot of people with Hungarian descent, it's a very personal journey and um, emotional to be able to heal that sort of intergenerational trauma of that loss and restore that feeling of having roots. And then, like I've said, you know, at other points in our conversation, also to have it be open to people who aren't Hungarian, who are musicians, maybe hobby or professional or dancers or otherwise just interested in the style is just to say that um you know i really uh have hold the class in a way where it's open to people of, of all different backgrounds and i really welcome anyone um to join obviously those aren't the only categories and those categories themselves overlap um and it's you know I, my hope is really to have an accessible space and that helps people in their relationship with music and culture and pronunciation everything you said at wherever they are in that journey so. Yeah, that, I mean that's so important. I mean the language, language uh, has been a barrier, to be honest, for mm-hmm. the first fifty years of the Tansas movement, um, right. and, and the next fifty years is going to be focusing on exactly the type of work you're doing. I'm trying to do here. You know, I dance hungry. My good friends there. You know, uh, right. like, like all over the place, um, which is what you know. And and I, I'm proud to say my my parents started kind of that knowledge sharing here in in, in North America and onwards and mm-hmm. you know so there's a lot of work to do um, a lot of these materials are still in Hungarian uh, you know even online right. so we're gonna have to help on that but it's getting easier right. and easier for instance latest well first, those of us yeah. those of us who are bilingual have to play a role yes. in getting those materials that are online into English and we all have to work together on on both sides really you have native Hungarian speakers who speak English at a pretty fluent level, but really need native English people to be refining it to a native, you know, English, uh, yeah. you know, text and not have it be sort of hunglish. And, and, you know, I think there's only really a handful of us who are experts in Hungarian folk music and high level or native level English speakers. So right. we, we really, in our, in our small handful of people, we, we really have to all work together to make this happen, as you said, in the coming years and decades. We will change the world, Zina. Well, that's right. Uh, thank you so much for being on. Uh, and uh, on behalf of uh, Zina Bozoi and myself, Kaman Magyar, thank you for listening to Tansas Talk interviews today and have a great time until we meet again.